Welcome to another episode of Coaches Corner University with me, as always, Paul O'Neill. How's everything going, Paul? Doing well, man. Can't complain. Beautiful weather. Got out by the pool this weekend and uh, you know, chatting with a very you know, well-read individual today, Dr. Kiley, oh, thank you. So. Oh, I thought you were talking to me. Yeah. No, no, not you. Not <laughs> okay. You. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, today we have on uh, John Kiley, who is a, a strength coach. Um, senior lecturer in elite performance at the Institute of Coaching and Performance University of Central Lancashire, Lan, Lancashire in Preston, United Kingdom. John, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Of course. No, I've, I've, uh, I listened to your podcast you did with uh, Mike Tashare and, and Eric Helms and, and Omar Esau, and um, I was really fascinated by the way you were able to articulate things and, and break things down and um i started diving into your your research and really love the um stuff that you're putting out there from a theoretical and conceptual point of view but the fact that you also have the hands-on experience of actually working with athletes and then transferring that into being able to disseminate the research and, and look through the research and come up with some creative ideas i think that's a a rarity within our field. And uh, anytime there's someone who's doing that, I, I always think that they're worth talking to at least for the, for some, some grain of, of knowledge that, that we may not be seeing. Okay, well, uh, I'll do my best, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to that billing. Expectations are extremely low on this podcast. So fantastic. Yeah, okay. so you're, you're in good yeah. company. Let's set that bar low. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, so one of the things that uh, I've been looking over within your, your research and some of the things that we've been discussing, um, right now I'm currently uh, working on my master's and then looking to get into a PhD program. And Paul has his master's. And coincidentally, we both got our master's from the same university. So one of the things we talk about a lot is kind of the periodization model and um, it being pronounced by the work of, of Hans Selye through general adaptation syndrome and, and maybe some of the um, misconcepts that were pulled from that and put into strength training literature and uh, periodization models. And, and that's something that you talked about heavily within your, your paper, uh, which is called Periodization Theory, Confronting an Inconvenient Truth. So I, I guess we can start off with maybe the idea of the general adaptation syndrome being something that was um, done by Hans Selye and then that was taken from his research and put into the strength conditioning field to really dictate uh, periodization for the last 50 years and and maybe some of the shortcomings of that and maybe some of the some of the good things of it as well if there are any from your point of view. Great. Um, okay, well, maybe let me answer that in a, in a roundabout way. Um, I was doing some, some reading recently and I, I came across this, this argument. Um, it's kind of a, a, a fallacy argument and it's called the Mott and Bailey argument. And it turns out that Mott and Bailey back in like medieval Europe was the way people living in you know communities used to organize how they lived or where they lived so a bailey is like a fortified uh area you know a, a kind of castle or some place that's heavily fortified sorry wrong way yeah bailey is that and the mott was normally a lower place that wasn't heavily fortified and that'd be where all the animals would be and where you'd spend nearly all of your time where you'd live where you'd work where you cook all that type of stuff and the relevance of that is that people lived in the, you know, in the mosque, which was low defense. But then if there was any sign of danger, they'd all move to the Bailey, which was high level of defense. Um, and that's used to describe a specific type of fallacious argument, whereby you anchor your argument to something that's really strong. And, and kind of indisputable in a sense. And then you tie your argument onto that strongly fortified argument. And it's like a sleight of hand. 
here's this fact, you can't ar argue with this, this is common sense, yada, 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 boom. So therefore, and you're off and running then with an argument. So if we look at periodization, uh, and I'm not, I'm not here to slam periodization, I, I totally got into this field purely as a coach, purely as a practitioner, trying to figure this stuff out. Um, and obviously I'm still figuring it out, but I think there's some things that we don't normally recognize that it is worth talking about. So back to the Mott and Bailey argument, it's kind of a sleight of hand. Here's this eminent scientist who did this fantastic work with zero technology. Um, when I say zero technology, Selye's method of evaluating how his rats adapted to stress was by killing them cutting out their gland, a uh, specific gland, and um, kind of crumbling it up and weighing it. That was his measurement yeah. too. <laughs> so this was not, you know, high tech. Uh, and I think that's kind of what, in periodization, and all the preeminent Western periodization articles always start with and Selye, 1934, publication in Nature, moves to general adaptation syndrome. Uh, and that's all for the time, really insightful, really good science. Uh, and basically what GAS, his general adaptation system des described is, if you were challenged uh, and, you know, in periodization terms, this was predominantly physical challenge. If you were physically challenged, there's a bit of a dip, then you recover. Uh, and when you recover, you don't just restore to where you were, you add a little bit on on top. And that become a kind of the underlying, I guess, basic assumption of training, physical training. Uh, yeah, so I thought that Mott and Bailey analogy is, is fine, is, is, is a nice one to understand this. And if we read some of the period are mostly periodization literature emanating from the from the West. Uh, that's where it starts. Selye. It is like this is our validation. This is our anchoring our argument in an eminent scientist. Uh, and this is our our fort fortification of what's going to come next. Then we have the little sleight of hand where it is. Aha, uh -huh. so therefore we should plan in, uh, in, a, in a logical sequential way and we should divide things up into chunks and all the other kind of cascade of assumptions tend to be anchored in that one, or at least that's the scientific validation for, for where, where most of them flow from. Something that might be of interest is I said, I specified in the West, in the East, obviously, or when I say East, I mean Soviet Union as the, you know, the, the great kind of uh, other player in periodization history. They weren't allowed, their theorists weren't allowed to refer to Western science at the time. So none of their uh, periodization theories are justified through Selye's work. They're justified through the work of Soviet scientists, but basically saying the same thing. And that same thing is, if you apply a physical stimulus, there's a predictable trajectory. Okay, you will, you will feel, you know, you will um, expend some energy, you will cause some damage, you will need time to recover, but then you'll recompensate over and above where you were. So that's, if you like, the uh, the way back background to yeah, organization, no. and it was those two influences, anchor to Selye anchored to Soviet work, but basically it was sports scientists, from my perspective, wanting to be able to say, this is predictable. The follow on thought to this is predictable is, okay, we can plan for this in right. this way. And it just coincidentally or not coincidentally, probably totally married with social planning theory at the time. We were still at that time, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. We were in the planning mindset of, uh, you know, scientific management. If it takes a worker this long to make one part, 
and we put you know this amount of raw material here, we can figure it all out. And that was you know the work of Frederick Winslow Taylor, early part of the 20th century. And all this type of logic worked perfectly in a machine shop. If you were working with a small line, not complicated product, everything in-house, it was a good way to plan, as long as you didn't care about how engaged the workers were, which might be a problem. Uh, so it all fitted in with that very me mechanistic way of planning. If you do this, you will get this. And in a sense, that's what periodization is about. It is about an assumption of predictability. If we do this in the gen, this will be our outcome. Broadly. Yeah. Right. So, so how's that? No, that's great. And, and the, the background behind it is, is awesome as well, because it gives them, uh, the listeners, something to kind of dive into if they, if they want a little bit more. So my question would be then, is it the understanding that you, the predictability is the issue? Or is it the adaptation that you get through the general adapt adaptation syndrome that's the issue, right? Is it, because does it, I guess the question is, is there always a super compensation phase? Do you have to regress a little bit in order for you to get better? Is that the issue? Or is it the predictability that we know exactly this is going to create this adaptation? That's the issue with the, with the gas principle for periodization approach. There, that, that's, a, that's a hell of a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of think there's maybe three parts to that. So if you'll bear with me, um, I think the first part is about predictability. Uh, and if you, if you boil down periodization to, to its basic presumption or assumption, it's that we can sit, I can sit with you in advance of the training program we're going to do, and we can plan what's going to work best. And then it becomes a good thing to stick to that plan. And sticking to the plan is a virtue. Sticking to a plan is a sign of, you know, a whole load of things that are positive things. And again, that's a very cultural thing. And of course, it's correct in some contexts, but in other contexts, it's damaging. So periodization was devised at a time when everyone thought that planning should be this kind of strict thing, this, this you know, outside some domains, you know, the military were starting to think more flexibly, uh, you know, scientists in some domains were starting to think more flexibly, but from an industrial and societal perspective, it was plan and stick to the plan. Celia provided a, a kind of a, a scientific justification for this. He drew his curve and it was a predictable curve. So, okay, so now we can this is biological validation of this idea. So, so we, we can plan um, in a regimented long-term forecasting type way. But all of, all of the scientific evidence with this is that you know, we all respond very differently and it is not clear how we will respond. It is not possible to predict essentially. Um, the other thing that, that I, I guess believed for quite a while uh, until you know some scientists or some science has bubbled up in the past few years I thought that well if I respond to this type of training two years ago maybe that's what I'm genetically programmed to respond well for so I should repeat that type of training but it turns out that doesn't work either it's like there's a, a, a temporal a time frame aspect to this how you will respond to different things so from a scientific perspective, that throws the scientific validation of periodization, I would think out the window, or at least into some confusion. Now I'm saying scientific there, I mean, from a coaching perspective, it's a totally different kettle of fish. How much, you know, how you plan for your athlete will depend on well, how much contact time do I have? How well does the athlete understand training and understand uh, how, how much latitude do I allow them to make their own decisions? Because you can't really do that with a very, very novice athlete that has no understanding. Um, so I guess what I'm doing there is separating 
there's a scientific argument that I think is really weak. But that doesn't mean that using some form of periodization isn't pragmatic in some contexts. But there are things that periodization never mentions, like athlete education. It actually never really mentions the athlete at all. Yeah. The athlete's opinions, the athlete's expectations, the athlete's kind of emotional attachment to the coach, belief in the coach, engagement in the program, all of those type of things, they make huge biological differences. But we're obsessed with, you know, 80, seven reps at 80% RM or whatever it is. Right. What about all the other stuff? Oh, yeah, well, that kind of falls outside planning. Why? If it feeds into how the athlete responds, isn't it our job to factor it into planning? Um, so maybe we'll come back to that if that's of interest, but just getting back to the third part of your question then, you mentioned something really, you mentioned something really interesting and that was, uh, I forget the exact words you used, but in my phraseology, do you need to do damage to improve? Like, do you need to break someone down? Do you need to go into this, uh, I need regeneration to make someone better? Uh, and I would think that from a scientific perspective, in most contexts, the answer to that is no, you don't. Um, now, I think that's not crystal clear, but past few years, I'd be heavily leaning towards that opinion that you can... Um, you can do good without doing damage. Yeah. And when I say damage, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm just talking about needing excessive recovery or substantial recovery. An example for the, uh, of this would be, and again, it's not really well studied uh, in, from a science perspective, is the concept of microdosing. And, you know, how you would do, for example, you might have priority lifts at a certain phase. Um, you're working towards specific objectives, but there might be some other things that you need, you want to improve, but they're maybe not a priority at the moment. How do you do that? Well, there's, there's good evidence that you can kind of microdose as in, I'm going to do one set, not maximum, this kind of rep range, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do that on a regular basis. And I'm going to track the, the, I'm going to find some metric to try and monitor if I'm improving. And if I am improving, then I just found a way that I can microdose, low energy, low time cost, um, and, and get improvements. Now, as an example, and again, this is a, and I can keep having to separate kind of science from practicality, but uh, I've done a lot of work in field sports. And obviously hamstring injury, number one injury in, in most field right. sports, certainly in soccer. But soccer players hate doing any type of hamstring exercise in season. It's like a total cultural paranoia. But what you can do is, okay, you know what we'll do? We'll do two reps of an isometric after your training session on Tuesday. Then you have Wednesday off and then you're back training Thursday. But you start with this the kind of really minute dose, put a lot of tension across the muscle, which drives a, a, an adaptive response, but you generate extremely low fatigue. And I guess, and I'm sorry if I'm going all around the houses here now, but um, this kind of brings me back to a thought on periodization and a, a kind of thought that harkens back to that pre-World War to industrial planning. You do everything in big chunks. It's like, well, that's kind of not the way our biology works. Our biology, we don't adapt in big chunks. We adapt slowly, gradually within our limitations, energetic limitations, genetic limitations, but they're slow. It's not like if I train twice as hard, I get twice the adaptation. That clearly doesn't work. Right. But what periodization has done is it's made our planning very clunky. You know, it's blocks. It's, you know, three sets of this, three sets of that for four weeks. Whereas it could be, well, I'm going to prioritize and just think about this through kind of first principles. 
if I want to get better at this exercise, I'm going to give that my most attention, my most energy, priority place in the session. But I also want to get better at all these and I'm going to microdose those. Ideally, I'm going to track them, I'm going to monitor it, I'm going to see my response and I'm going to adapt them, uh, as we go. That was a really long uh, diversion in answering your question. We don't need to make people tired to make them better. Um, I think that's clear in things like strength, endurance. It's certainly clear in things that would be important to uh, athletes in kind of uh, more complex sports where it's, you know, you can improve skills without making people fatigued or without driving them into the ground. Anyway, sorry, long diversion. No, it's great. Paul, you have anything? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I'm, what I'm kind of hearing is that the argument against the general adaptation curve is not necessarily that it doesn't happen, right? That we don't detrain if we have a huge stress or that we don't compensate and have an adaptation. It's the manipulation of, well, how big is that stressor that we're placing? How often can we place it? How much of a detraining effect is that going to have? How can we time that training stimulus in a way to get more, uh, more frequency to it? And that's based on, you know, strength as a neurological adaptation. Uh, the fact that, you know, we had, um, we had Sam Buckner on last week and he was talking about that there is a maximal threshold for protein synthesis to flip that switch and anything over that, it's like, okay, well, why not just flip that switch really often and have a lot of frequency to it? Um, I think a lot of people get tied to general adaptation syndrome because it's really simple and it makes sense. So if we can have this predictable curve and we can plan out accordingly, something that Tony and I always talk about is, is stress management and how some weeks you just might not recover the same as other weeks. Some weeks you may have more reserve to train than other weeks. So if the plan has flexibility to it, and as you mentioned, I love that you mentioned the athlete and how the athlete has to be the center of it. If I educate this athlete on how to manipulate their own training within my framework, and then you track predictably over time, that seems to be the best way to get results and to keep the athlete healthy and to allow for you know optimal frequency, optimal intensity, and realizing that you kind of have to take what's there. Um, I also love how you mentioned microdosing and things like you know one set here, two sets here. As long as that's a meaningful set and you're not accumulating too much fatigue that it would impact later sets, it makes a lot of sense to have a concurrent approach to your training, right? Make sure that this little programming in these big clunky blocks. I remember reading block periodization back in the day and being like, how do they know that, you know, I can maintain my neurological adaptation for eight weeks? How do they know that? What if I can't? You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really loving what you're saying because you're not necessarily throwing gas under the bus and saying no, uh, but you're also saying that it's a little bit more nuanced. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of stuff there I agree with. I think um, just the last point first maybe, In terms of periodization and in sp sports training in general, we've anchored ourselves to gas. And gas is a nice story. Celia was a great scientist, but it was nearly 100 years ago, weighing, you know, pituitary glands or whatever it was. Um, and I guess the key assumption, the key two assumptions maybe if I could generalize a little bit about Celia's work, is the assumption that biological stress, biological consequence. So he didn't think much about, okay, well, you know, what if the baby was awake all night? Am I going to have the same biological consequence? Or, you know, for example. Uh, and the other thing was predictability. So if, if, if these rats have this curve, all human athletes will have the same curve. And clearly that's not true. So I think... Uh, so it's kind of tempting to dive into the contemporary kind of stress literature, but 
I don't think we need to necessarily do that. It's just enough to say that this was a really blanket assumption. Good history, good science, not how we should, not, it should not inform how we plan. We know already without anyone referring us to Celia, if I train hard, I'm going to be a bit tired. If I want to get the optimal benefit when I train again, I need to rest. You know, and that's kind of the basics. If I train serially, I will get better or I will break down if I, if I get my management wrong. So in a way, I kind of see some of that stuff as a distraction. Yeah, now, so that's one thing. Another thing you said there that I really liked was, you know, obviously about stress and about how you know, all demands on us, and this is genuinely the way I think of it, all demands on us take from a central resource. Okay, now, now that's a clumsy way of saying it, and it's a blanket statement, but the science, you know, suggests this, that if I am constantly stressed, i.e. I feel I can't cope, I am not going to respond well. Why? Well, our body has a very limited amount of, obviously, energy, brain space, but obviously is a limited amount of all the raw materials that go into making neurotransmitters and chemical messengers and hormones. We can't just fabricate those. They're a limited resource. So the body needs to make, brain and body need to make a value judgment. What do I need now? Do I put resources into recovery or do I put resources into preparing like crazy for a, a challenge that's going to hit me in tomorrow or six hours time, which you could equate to stress in a sense. And if all my resources are going to, oh my God, I need to get ready for this. I need to get ready for this. I have this big challenge coming here, whatever that challenge might be. There is no way your body's going to be laying down tissue and making all those little micro repairs it needs to do and even laying down that new brain tissue those new brain connections, we need to learn new skills. So, so I think that was, there's the great oversights, the, the predictability one, and then the assumption that physical equals physical. And that's what periodization literature has done that completely. You never hear, well, actually, how confident the athlete feels is going to be a huge dictator of how they respond. So, no. Sorry, I know I've gone off on another long tangent here. I really liked what you mentioned about block periodization. Because when those articles came out, again, I was, I was all over them and I was like, this is really interesting. And, and I had a couple of contacts, uh, one contact in particular who trained with um, Bondarchuk in Canada. Uh, so, you know, it was really useful to talk to him about what was written and what actually happened, how they, were, in, were parallel and they weren't parallel. <laughs> Bondarchuk disagreed with a lot of stuff that was written about what Bondarchuk said. Uh, and he turns out to have been this very flexible, very tuned in, uh, very community, communicative coach. Anyway, I'm digressing again. Uh, in relation to block periodization, what you mentioned about, you know, there's an assumption of eight weeks of this for up, I, I dived into the references and they were all exclusively, this is a book that the author wrote previously. <laughs> so validation for th me saying this is something I said previously. No root science whatsoever. Sometimes there was, but it was, you know, something that you'd have to go crawling through some library and, or a dungeon in Moscow to find. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, does that mean periodization doesn't work? It brings us back to definitions of periodization. Right. And at the moment, it's a moving target. You know, the guy who pioneered, who started the whole thing, who in a sense introduced the term periodization, which was Matfield back in the Soviet Union, he didn't, he didn't define it. It was up for others to define it. And I think it was Samuel Buckner actually, who had the paper published recently with all the definitions. Yeah. I thought that was fantastic. I mean, 
I don't know, 80, 90 definitions. <laughs> it was a but lot. It was, yeah. So it's a very much a moving target. So from a science perspective, that's a problem because you don't know what you're arguing for or against. And it's shape-shifting. If you, if you come across an argument you don't like, you change the definition. Or right. if you're on the other side, you pick the clumsiest, clumsiest definition and then you attack that. So it's just, it's just bad. For coaches, it is like a complete shit show of mixed messages. You know, and when I'm saying coaches, I'm talking about people who do not have, uh, you know, years of a career to throw at burying through this research. Yeah, okay. I think I run out of steam on that point. Yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, de- I like what you're what you're saying there with everything. Like it reminds me of uh, Lisa Barrett Feldman. She's a neuroscientist, oh, yeah. and uh, she wrote a book, and she refers to body budgeting as you only have so much you can allocate, which goes along with uh, allostatic load and being sure. able to manage stress via those variables of. Once you add something, you must take away something else. You can't continue to add and add and add. So being able to understand not only the physiological side of things, but also the the biopsychosocial side of things is extremely important when fully trying to flesh out a a program that is dictated on on stress management, right? Like most of the physiological stuff in nature is, is, is very acute. And if you look at all the fatigue research that can help dictate some of the programming that you do with your athletes, a lot of it is derived from perception and and the brain being, um, you talk about it too, the brain as like this master gland, master regulator uh, that Timothy Nook talks about as well as it being the governor of a, of a lot of things uh, physiologically as well. And that's something that um, I would like you to kind of get into the idea that right? Allostatic load is something that will help dictate our week to week, even day to day periodization of of the athletes. Because if you look at some of the literature now, um, they're doing um, a lot of blood work and they're doing a lot of continuous monitoring of athletes during season and out of season. And you're seeing dramatic decreases, but on an inter-individual level. So the idea of block periodization being the driving force for all your athletes doesn't make sense, right? Because we can see some athletes can maintain their testosterone throughout season. Some athletes, their testosterone dips. If your testosterone is going all over the place, your ability to manage stress and cortisol from training is going to be up and down. So that means your recoverability is going to be up and down, right? So being able to monitor those things, get the players feedback, maybe doing blood work every four weeks, will allow you to kind of individualize the program based on those individual stresses of the person. So you talked about, you know, the perception of buy-in, the perception of how that athlete feels, whether or not they have exams, whether or not they have midterms, right? All those things are going to dictate how you program for that athlete. So it's not one of these linear trajectories. Like you said, it's not that pretty model, right? It's like here, 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 here. Some days are better than others. So how do you go about predicting that with your athletes like what are some of the metrics and biofeedback that you try to get from your athletes to kind of dictate those things i know that's a lot of questions but you take notes so i figured i can keep going <laughs> it's a load it's a load of good questions uh and my notes if you saw them are really uh scribbles of key words and uh, yeah. I, wouldn't say I, I didn't capture everything there but um yeah Kind of, I, I, I thought of a couple of words as you were saying that, because what you're describing is, in my words, what we were looking for, I'm going to say we, I mean us culturally years ago, what we were looking for was a, a prescription. What we're talking about now is, oh, no, no, okay, not a prescription. It's designing a process. So prescription, I tell you what to do, you do it. Da, 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 all through, throughout this timeline process me and you come together we talk we see where you are we see what our needs are we develop a logical jumping in point we track it or monitor it in some way now often there aren't good metrics 
So sometimes it's, we need to make a judgment call. But either way, what you're doing is, instead of using, you know, what I would think of as very kind of archaic, clumsy logic to justify a long-term prescription, we develop a process. What's our jumping in point? Okay, we'll review this in a week, two weeks, tomorrow, four weeks, depending on the context and contact time, and we'll evolve it. But we have to evolve it against our objectives at peak season or show time, whatever it is. And I think that's what we're kind of talking about. Everything we're talking about is the difference between prescribing and developing, evolving a process with the athlete. So that's the first thing to get out of my head. Um, I love you mentioned Lisa Feldman Barrett. Yeah. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, and I think she's one of the kind of the, the pioneers in the area of, um, yeah, how our biology is completely inextricably, in, or sorry, inextricably linked with what's going on emotionally. Um, and so for us as coaches, we need to we need to take care of that. It's not enough to give someone a, this is what you do. There is a, uh, I, I, I think in two ways. I think written, uh, managing expectations and not managing, but developing expectations, but realistically, I think in terms of placebo effect and coaches for me are placebos, where placebo is a real thing. You get a benefit because you believe this is good for me. This person is the right coach for me. I, I, I trust my coach. That's a huge thing. Regardless of how good or bad you are technically, obviously you want to be good technically, but that is for me is like a, an essential first step. Uh, you know, and I've said this before, I've seen coaches who technically were not the best in the world, but Olympic gold medalists, no problem. And I've seen coaches who were very, you know, high level of technical expertise, but not good communicators. And communicators doesn't mean $10 words. It means you speak the same language as the athlete, regardless of what that language is. But you can relate, you can communicate, and they see and acknowledge and, and kind of absorb your, your dedication and uh, motivation towards achieving their cause, achieving their goals. So I'm saying a lot there, just try and clear it up. Um, Emotion, stress, obviously they feed into one another. Belief, expectations, all of these things to a large extent, not a small extent, to a large extent will regulate how readily or reluctantly your brain and body will release resources to adapt. Following training to adapt. If I am stressed and I'm you know, pissed off at my coach and I don't think they're the right person for me and I'm worried about everything and emotionally I'm up in a heap. I am not going to adapt. Why? Well, because my body feels like it's under threat. It will not release resources. It will hold on to them because, no, there's a, the apocalypse is coming. I need to gather everything. Extreme case of this is you get a child, put them in a war zone where they're extremely stressed and their growth rate stops or it slows down dramatically. Why? It's exactly that. It's they're under such brain and body are interpreting everything that goes around them as this is a challenge. I need to be on high alert all the time. I need to be ready to go straight away all the time. I don't have time for building projects. I'm not going to lay down muscle or bone mass. All my resources are going into survival right now. So, you know, it's a psychogenic dwarfism. Extreme example, but speaks to the same um, rationale yeah. and Lisa Feldman's Barrett's writing totally uh, resonates with that there's one other thing I'll add in uh, and I don't know if this is me taking going a step too far but if you're up for something that's kind of on the edge uh, if you take Lisa Feldman Barrett is a good example and there's, there's a few other really top scientists around and they would argue that 
uh, I'm interpreting to training contexts. What I've just said there about if you know is if I'm here and I train, but I have all these other assumed demands on my resources, then I am not going to give a lot of resources to recovering from training. Yeah, so let's take that point. I think the evidence at the moment is that that judgment is based on a prediction. Your brain makes a prediction of what's going to happen next. So this in Lisa Feldman Barrett language would be predictive processing or predictive coding. Okay, so that is that my brain makes prediction of what is going to happen next, and then I adapt in advance to that prediction. Now, for me as a, as a coach, as a trainer, the relevance of that is, okay, there's something subtle there. All of our training theory is about this is the stimulus, this is the response, and there's a direct relationship between those. But what the science at the moment, as you know, exemplified by Lisa Feldman Barrett, is no, no, it's not, it's not the stimulus that drives the adaptive response. It is your prediction of the relevance of that stimulus to you and your prediction of how well you can cope with that. And that's something different. If I have whatever 180k in the bar, um, and I don't know it is, or I feel, oh, this is a shit weight, you know, or oh, this session always winds up my knee and I'll be sore tomorrow. If I have all these kind of negative thoughts, subsequently I have a a negatively framed pr uh, prediction of what's going to happen as a consequence of this session. I think all the logic is to suggest that you won't get the optimal benefit. If on the other hand, you are, I am totally up for this. I think this is really working for me. I really believe in this. I love legs day, whatever it is. I think that, I, I think you will have a change response. So if you were doing the Todd experiment, you know, you take one of us, you genetically engineer an identical twin with an identical history, and you walk into the gym, the two of you, and you both get the same prescription and the same weight in the bar. But one person predicts, oh, I don't know about this, this looks a little risky, whatever, I don't like this. The other person thinks, I love this, this is a challenge. And I can understand and I can draw a clear line between my sporting ambitions and me performing well in this lift. I think you'll get two completely different adaptive responses. Uh, and again, I'm not just kind of pulling that out of my ass. It's, it would all be based on the past 20 years of predictive processing, predictive coding research. And basically, just to sum it up, it's not what happens that dictates your response. It's your prediction of what's going to happen and how you need to respond in advance. And that's, for me, and so in the past year or two, I've started to kind of get my head around it, but it, it's kind of been a game changer for me in terms of how I communicate, how I present sessions, how I listen to athlete feedback and feed forward information, um, monitoring, all those type of things has changed subtly in a lot of ways, but I think the changes overall have been quite big. I think, I think that's super interesting, mostly because something that I've always said to athletes and that I actually had to go through myself as like an evolution as a coach was when I was younger, I definitely took that analytic route. Like I was like, based on the research, all the books that I've read, this is, this is the program that's going to get this kid to where they need to go. But it never worked. And the reason was, is I completely lacked the soft skills to get that athlete to believe in what I was trying to get them to do. They didn't have any confidence in me. They didn't have any confidence in the program. Um, and the results spoke for themselves. As soon as I got to a place where I had the athletes trust, I had their buy-in, it didn't matter if that program was written with a crayon and a McDonald's napkin, it would have got them strong. And I think that also you're, what you're saying could also be the argument for, hey, we have all these roads to Rome, like especially when we look at barbell sports, no two all-time world record holders train the same way. 
But if they believe in what they're doing and what they're doing can get them to where they want to go, that would definitely have a huge impact on the results that they get from that program. Like we have all-time world record holders training with dynamic, uh, uh, with daily undulating periodization. We have all-time world record holders that train twice a week. Yes, they're both different morphologies, ages, all, et cetera, et cetera. But they're both all-time world record holders, right? So the, I, I, love, I love what you're saying in the emphasis on soft skills. And I think that's a big point for young coaches to take home is that unless you get out in front of people and you practice communicating, it doesn't matter how much, you know, empirical evidence and research you have under your belt. You have to be able to speak the athlete's language. Yeah, look, I, I totally echo all that. And what I'd say is a lot of the time people um, assume that when you talk like this, you're just talking about it's, it's a nice to do. It's nice if the athlete respects you and thinks you're good at your job. It's nice if they look forward to sessions. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. Biologically, the, the, you know, the, the soup in your brain, the neurochemical content, the endorphin release, all those things is totally tied up with how you feel, how you feel about this session. Not how you feel now, but how you predict you're going to feel. That's the thing. Like, and if you think of it as, and I, I'm not sure if it's Lisa Feldman Barrett that explains it like this, but if you consider your brain, it is sitting in this dark cave in a vat of fluid. It does not know what's going on. It's getting some really, really imperfect information. It can't assimilate all that information and process it. There's way too much of it. So what does it do? It tries to learn patterns and then it makes predictions and it adapts your biology in advance to prepare for the next challenge. So if I'm always stressed, if I'm kind of a high, high anxiety bunny, I'm gonna have problems adapting well. And I guess where you see this come out in the sports uh, world is, or at least in a research perspective, it's with, it's with injuries. You wanna injure someone up their stress. Yeah. You know, you want someone to deselect, to, to, to leave a sport, increase their stress, overtrain everything, you know, increase their stress, decrease their expectations, increase their nocebo effect. So increase their negative expectations. You know, this is a great exercise, but yeah, uh, you know, it, it'll do this or it might do this. Or, uh, sorry, that was a little awkward. What I mean is, so obviously, you know, you understand, or you know the nocebo, placebo type contrast. I think that's a huge player in what we do, which is what, you know, you've just spoke to Paul. Uh, but I don't think we always factor that in. And there has been some recent studies that things like coaches' expressions can change hormonal profile of the athlete. You know, I think, oh my God, you know, I've been coaching, I've been coaching a long time. How many times have I put my foot in it? How many times mm -hmm. have I screwed up just because I was too lazy or not switched on enough or too comfortable to, uh, to, to keep kind of monitoring myself in a close level. Um, so I think what we're kind of coming around to is, and bringing it back to periodization. I mean, obviously we have a conversation like this and I come across as the anti-periodization guy, but I kind of don't care. You know, I'm not trying to be anti anything. I'm just trying to uncover things and find out how I can do it better myself. And if you're, if you're an, coaching people and it's you know over the past year it's online and it's very periodic contact you have to make blunt generalizations you got to be pragmatic and if you like a particular periodization format go nuts i mean i, I don't see anything wrong with that it's understanding the deficits it's understanding where you need to fill in and have communication and maybe farm out some decision-making latitude to the athlete, you know, if this, then this, and educate the athlete. You know, ed educate the athlete from a training perspective um, and try and, uh, I guess, harness their perceptions, how they're feeling, because 
they obviously have access to the most pertinent information. We're just looking in from the outside. So, you know, from an academic perspective, yeah, you know, it's a it's a schoolyard fight. You know, and I'll, I'll probably stick my oar in a couple more times, but from a coaching perspective, I kind of don't care about that. It's all bullshit in a way. Um, it's like, what do I do on the, on the floor? Um, and I think for that, that's, that's a hard problem. And I think maybe one of the undercurrents of periodization that first caused me to kind of question it and push back in it was the, the assumption that if I do this, I'm okay. That's planning taken care of. And no, it's not. And we shouldn't be lulled into that false sense of security because, oh, well, they mentioned Selye, so everything else follows and everything is scientifically proven and blah, blah, blah. We should know this is the same as, you know, if you were two and someone says, here's the plan for your life, go and knock it out. It's like, it's not practical. I need to work through this from first principles, navigate all these hurdles myself, um, stay switched on, stay, stay alive to, to risk and, and to opportunity. Uh, and I think, and again, I'm saying this as a long-time coach, if our philosophy is um, formed by these big kind of blanket foundations do this, then do this, then do this, and it will happen in this time frame. And yeah, then we're not going to be that sharp. We're not going to be that switched on. Yeah. Another uh, mini rant there. So yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it's great. What what you're what you're mentioning too with the perception of the athlete is something that I've been doing some research on and and looking a lot into. And uh, I was listening to. Andrew Huberman, he was talking about this the other day, saying that if you see you have a run planned for the evening and the entire day you're thinking about that run in a negative manner, then your cortisol and everything else, all your stress hormones are going to be elevated. So that run is going to have more of a negative outcome on your ability to perform and recover mainly just because your perception of that run was so negative to begin with. And they've done research on that lately, showing those types of perceptions are negative consequences in recovery and performance. And I noticed that too with athletes when the, I have some athletes who check in and their check-ins and Paul, you can probably relate to this is like always negative. Like the first two sentences are always how bad the week went. And then I would ask them, you know, I was like, based on this, based on this email, I would assume this was the one of the worst weeks you've ever had in training. He's like, no, there was a lot of good things too. I was like, well, why don't we focus on that? And the ones that always focus on the negatives also have a pretty nice correlation to, like you said, injuries. They're often the most injured athletes as well, because they're going into every session with this negative thought process. And that's something that I've been trying to think of as a coach, like, how can I get ahead of that? How can I make things not be such a negative aspect and what I've been doing recently is incorporating more positive ways to end a workout like if I think about I want that athlete to leave the gym not thinking they just had the hardest workout of their life but thinking I feel better leaving the gym than I came into the gym so I'm really putting a lot of emphasis on parasympathetic recovery cool downs doing movements that they feel good about not doing movements that that kill the athletes, like a lot of coaches, especially within the sports performance realm, they'll do some type of maybe a lactic or lactic type of conditioning, pushing the sleds at the end of the workout because they want their athletes to leave that workout feeling like they had a good workout. And I've been focusing more on trying to have those athletes leave feeling like this was an easy workout. So then the next time it comes about, they're not thinking I almost died during this workout. They're thinking, man, I left this workout it was fun. I'm really excited to, to do it again. Have you been switching kind of the way you end your workouts or the paradigm of, of how you set up your training sessions to leave in a more positive note or anything along those lines? I think that's, um, that leads to a really big question because it's easy to kind of talk about these things and for me to wave my hands in the air, like I know what I'm talking about, but how you actually action them is quite difficult. So yeah. Let, let me give you an example. So, and this is this is a few years ago, maybe four years ago, five years ago, I started doing this. 
uh, and I was working with a, a squad at the time, you know, international major sport. Um, and I was starting to think about all these things, specifically around placebo and how can placebo have such a powerful effect? And placebo is a real effect. It's not like for people who just are easily laid or whatever the kind of conventional assumption is. This is a real thing. And all it is is if I have trust in you, I'm going to feel better when I'm around you. I'm going to have a different hormonal profile, different neuromuscular, neurochemical profile and perform better. So I, had the, I was doing these sessions that were, uh, I thought too big, too many people, really, you know, busy training week. And players would go from meetings to fields, to gym, to meetings, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, so here's the thing. I thought, well, you can't kind of do this perfectly. And if you think about it, if you're dealing with a squad, they're all different people. Some of them respond well to humor, you know, and they always want to joke or some of them respond well to something else. And it's like, all of a sudden we're setting a bar up here for ourselves that we have to be all things to all people, which isn't feasible and which would suck us dry anyway. So my thought was, okay, what can I do that can slightly, and again, setting a low bar, just a little bit better than we currently do it. Um, and what I did was before every session, I have a big whiteboard in the gym, objectives for the session. Uh, and it's like took 10 seconds to remind them, here's why we're here. Now, in my, to them, it was just, okay, this is just reminding us of what's recession. For me, it's making a link to their ultimate goals. We're going to do some of this. That will make you more resilient. We're going to do some of this because this will make you more powerful. So it's just, again, drawing the line between what you're doing now and your ultimate ambition. Um, and then there might be something around uh, what to do if you have any doubt, if you're not feeling it. And again, this was a very macho kind of contact sport. So it might be, um, you know, any concerns, come and talk to me. Or, you know, lots of previous injuries. Let me know if, you, if, if, you're, if you're not feeling it and we will make a decision then. We won't necessarily adapt because you can't always be the person that they come to to make life easier. Sometimes they come to you and you have to make a judgment. Well, actually, if you're gonna go out and compete in this environment, sometimes you're just gonna to have to suck it up. Yeah. You know, you can't always back away, back away in training and then give it everything in, in competition. That's not the way kind of habits or your brain work. Um, but if you were, so so that's a judgment call. And obviously there's no rules to that. It's just, you got to make the right decisions and you got to be pretty sure. Normally what you do in that situation is, okay, well, maybe we won't back off today, but what we will do is we'll do an extra warm up set or we'll check your technique or we'll do, we'll introduce some minor action that convinces you that, okay, I'm a little better prepared for it now. Okay, I'm starting to uh, go around and uh, get lost here. So I do something at the start. Uh, I'd have some kind of rules for come and tap me on the shoulder if X, Y, and Z. Um, and then uh, there might be a, any questions, anything you're not clear on, boom, okay. Two and a half minutes gone into your session. At the end of the session, now you don't want it to be like school where you're bringing adults, you know, okay, everyone back around the whiteboard. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not like that, but I would have thought through, I need to reiterate why this was a good session. Um, if there's a kind of a learning point for us as a group for the next session or for before the next session, whatever that might be, nutrition thing, a discipline thing, a timing thing, I hit them with that as well. And I kind of leave them then with, again, in some way, and it wouldn't be a formulaic way because they they tune that out if it was a formulaic, but I again make some link to that's a good session, that's going to help you next week when blah blah blah. I'd make some link between what they were doing now in the gym and what they're going to do or what they hope to do soon. So again, 
another uh, long round of houses answer, but no, that's great. I, 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 and I guess what it is, it's just, it's probably, I, I think it's what great coaches have been doing forever, but non-consciously maybe. It's building links and associations and guiding thoughts and guiding emotions and uh, enhancing the athlete's belief in their program and to believe in their support team and to believe in themselves. Again, as a caveat, you can't do that blindly. You know, we're not snake oil salesmen and we shouldn't be. You don't want to big up somebody beyond their capacity. So I think, again, there's a fine judgment call there. You want to get the placebo effect by being positive, but you don't want to kind of turn into a bullshitter that nobody trusts. Right. And you want to be honest, right? Because it's our job and it's what we love. So, uh, so there's all those fine lines to be negotiated. But from a coaching perspective, uh, I think this is what good coaching is all about. And a lot of us in strength sports have been very guilty of this in a sense, culturally. It's like, it's technique and it's design and it's sets and reps and how you arrange them. And we've tended to, and because it tends to be kind of macho, we tend to ignore the softer things. But um, I think that's a big mistake. Yeah, I agree. Paul, do you wanna close off with anything? Honestly, I came into this conversation as like kind of just questioning because it's I'm a very analytical person in, in my approach. And so the idea of gas as a framework to look at and understand that, yes, there are implications on how, dig, how deep we dig the ditch and how much stressors are on it and the perceptions before and after. And I kind of built my whole thing around yeah, we're going to have a detraining and then we need to, we're going to train and then we need to rest and then we'll recover and train again. And all of that is influenced by these other factors we've discussed today. And I actually, personally, I really enjoyed this conversation because it did bring in a lot of other thoughts that I didn't necessarily have before. Uh, and so I, I genuinely just want to thank you because this is awesome. Oh, well, look, thank you very much for, the, for that feedback. Um, I, I guess, you know, I, yeah, and I'm glad because that's why I, I, I do this work primarily to figure it out for myself because I'm curious about it, but uh, to help coaches rather than publish papers is, is the next goal in, on, the, on, on that um, hierarchy. So thank you for that feedback. I think maybe there's one or two things and I won't labor it, but there's a couple of interesting things. You know, Matt Fiat, who you've probably heard of, you know, the fundamentals of sports training, a little green book. He was, so he's called the father of periodization. Um, but that came about the Soviet Union after the 52 Olympics. Uh, USA came first in the medal table, the Soviet Union came second, which they saw as a failure. And uh, maybe it wasn't 52 now, but yeah, it was 52 perhaps. Um, they got Matthew, a PhD student, gave him all these numbers, crunched the numbers and come up with the right way to plan. That's where it came from. That's what it was. It was numbers, training numbers. Uh, I, think, I think weightlifting, swimming, cycling, or weightlifting, swimming, running. And it was just their, their training records. And that's where this idea came from. So if we think about it in that context, I'm not arguing against uh, the intelligence of any of the people that did it. They came before. We have greater insight. We don't honor their work by copying what was right, made sense in the past. It clearly doesn't make sense now. We have the complex job as coaches of how do I... So I had a complex problem made simple, but now I see that the, sim the solutions were oversimplified. Now I have a complex problem again. <laughs> But the thing is, I think that if we approach it with that more holistic view of it's not just sets, reps, intensities, it's it's all the things we talked about, about the athlete buy-in, the athlete trust in you as a person, 
uh, and your integrity and your shared goals with them, then I think we can argue all day about the mechanics. But that stuff is nearly the non-negotiable stuff. Um, yeah. So thank you for the conversation. Um, yeah. Enjoy. Yeah, no, thank you. Really appreciate it. And uh, that's a great way to wrap things up is understanding those fundamental ideas of uh, kind of that physiological and biopsychosocial model and kind of combining it all and getting to know your players and communication. Like you said, some of the best coaches aren't the best X's and O's. Phil Jackson's a perfect example of that. The players bought into him and he's one of the best coaches, but X's and O's wise, he wasn't known as that type of coach. So being the one that your players can trust, your, your athletes can trust, and, and they kind of um, respect you in a way to where they know that you have their best interests at heart is something that you should be focusing on a lot as a coach rather than trying to design the perfect Excel spreadsheet to, to give everyone, right? We're not robots, sure. we're, we're human beings who you know want to be acknowledged for our hard work and for, for what we do and showing up in our, in our life, right? And to dismiss that is kind of like you're dismissing the athletes as individuals and that's going to be a hard way to create any uh, type of buy-in. So appreciate you coming on and, and uh, talking to us about this and, and um, giving us some of your time. Oh, uh, I enjoyed it. Thanks for the invitation and, uh, and I hope people get something out of it. Yes, sir. And if um, I, you don't, if, if people want to follow you or do anything, I know you have a Twitter and you have an Instagram that's uh, sparsely used, <laughs> but I know yeah, you I, can, you can look up uh, John Kiley, K-I-E-L-Y on ResearchGate. And if you want to look at any of his papers or any of his research, uh, that's a great resource to find any of his work. And then anything else you want to throw out there, John, feel free to. I uh, know. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll, I will get back to social media uh, soon, but uh, I've been off it for a, bit, a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I guess um, research case is a good place if you're interested in the papers, uh, a little bit of everything in there. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's me. Perfect. Sounds good, sir. Thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you.